How many of you guys out there were guilty at one point or another of being a hellraiser? Raise your hands. <laughs> if you remember the first time you raised hell in your neighborhood, or first time, what happened? Because I remember what happened to me. It was always that little friend. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you right now for your spirit. We thank you right now for your word. Father God, I pray that you would use me to be a vessel that would be used for you. And Lord God, I just pray that the, that the words that you speak through me will land on the ears of those who have the ability to hear through your spirit. And Lord God, we pray for salvation, healing, deliverance right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now keep standing, please. Keep standing. Keep standing. We're going to open up with our opening verse. Now, many of you have read this verse time and time again. So what I'm going to share with you today isn't going to be anything really new. It's just going to be a reminder of some things that you probably have learned but have forgotten. And uh, let me put my glasses on. Now, this is the second time I've preached on television with glasses because a year ago I didn't need glasses. Now I do. See, 42 messed you up. <laughs> and I'm already 43, so life goes on. Here we go. Opening verse. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. We're going to read down to verse 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Father God, add an extra blessing to this word right now, Lord God. And I just pray that you would just begin to do something mighty in this congregation. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to touch your neighbor's arm or shoulder. Just touch him. Go ahead, touch him. That person you just touched is not your enemy. Think about it. That person next to you, your neighbor, your bully, that bully in school, that bully in school is not your enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. If anybody's coming against you and you want to retaliate against him, you need to remind yourself one thing. That person's not your enemy. Satan is your enemy. You need to remember that. When your boss man comes on the job and starts nagging and complaining and trying to put you down and call you everything but a child of God, you need to remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The person that you need to be mad at is not him, but the devil using him. I want you to read something real quick. Check this out. It says, I need my glasses. Here we go. I got to get used to this. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Check this out in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now check this out. Think about it. The wiles of the devil. And right immediately after he said the wiles of the devil, the trickeries of the devil, he immediately talks about we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, which gives me the inclination that Satan will use you. See, we think in spiritual warfare is all this invisible stuff going on. Uh-uh. Spiritual warfare is happening with you. See, the trickery of the devil is real simple. He wants to trick you into doing the things that he physically can't do. Because think about it. If Satan could really do the things that, he, that we believe that he could do, if I had a knife. Anybody got a pocket knife on you? Come on. Imagine if I had a knife, and I'm Satan. Oh, here we go. Woo! Here we go. Flora, you, you got to work my camera, baby. Work my camera. Work my camera. See this? That's all right. That's all right. Now, this is what most people think that Satan can do. Whoa, just floats in the air, and he can just kill people. Uh-uh. A knife ain't never killed nobody by itself. He can't pick up that knife and kill that brother over there. He can't pick up that knife and cut that lady over there. Satan has to trick you 
for another person who's not following Jesus into doing the job for him. See, that's what we're dealing with, people. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. See, whoo, this thing is sharp. I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> hey, I never cross you. <laughs> Praise God. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Because remember, Satan uses people to do his dirty deeds. And you need to remember that. Who is Satan going to use to do his dirty deeds? Us. Let's go a little bit deeper. If we are to stand against the wiles of the devil, we need to know what those trickeries are. So wiles means trickery, in case you guys in high school don't understand. Those trickeries mean wiles, and wiles means trickery. It means he's, he's doing things to trick you. Now, what kind of trickery does this man do? Well, let's look at something real quick. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. Now, this is going to be interesting. Because you're like, well, yeah, what do they got to do with trickery? This is, this is a verse that we read all the time, and I don't see nothing dealing with trickery. Oh, watch this. I'm going to explain something to you. Here we go. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the, war, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, which means they're not fleshly. But they are what? Mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, what are these strongholds? Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And doing what? Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The number one battlefield that you're going to be dealing with is your mind. Y'all don't hear me. Satan likes to come and attack the way you think. If he can convince you to do something up here, it's just a matter of seconds before you do it with your physical body. That's why you always have to be aware of your enemy. He's not playing games. Let me tell you something. I went to visit a missionary uh, the other day. He's a missionary to the Middle East. He's won a lot of Muslims to the Lord. And he showed me the decapitation of those um, journalists. And I saw those images in my head. And it put a fire in me. Because I realized that these people were willing to die for what they believed. How many of you would die for what you believe? Yes, I would too. Because that's the seriousness of this battle. Satan has gotten into the mind of these evil people and convinced them to do horrible things. Don't be mad at the Muslim. Be mad at the devil. Because he's the one that's orchestrating all that mess. Okay, let me move on. I can beat a dead horse. Y'all quiet. Y'all got me nervous. <laughs> quiet, church boy. I, I'm, I ain't even started my message yet, and y'all quiet. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. All right, here we go. So how does this battle work? I want you to look at James chapter 3 real quick. Go over to James chapter 3. I'm going to show you some things because I want you to think about something. When Satan's attacking your mind, what's the primary weapon that this dude uses to attack your mind? When he wants to change your thoughts, your patterns, your behaviors, what is the primary modus operandi of this evil, wicked fool? Well, I want you to look at something. And I'm just going to point out a few verses. And this ain't in the notes, but I'm going to get there. Verse 5, John, uh, James chapter 3, verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it sets 
and it is set on fire by hell. The number one modus operandi of Satan to get you to get things into your mind is someone else's words. You're no good for nothing. Oh, you not pretty. Oh, you ugly. Oh, no, you stupid. Oh, you Mexican. Oh, you black. Oh, you white. You're an Alabama fan. (laughs) (laughs) That's what he does. He will use even believers. How many times have we said something bad about our brother or sister in this church? Not even knowing that the words that we're speaking are causing death to them. Because you're destroying their spirit. You're destroying the life of God in them. How many times have you looked at your own child and said things negative? Let me tell you what my mama used to do to me when I was a bad kid. Because I wasn't always a pretty little preacher kid sitting in the pulpit doing all this cool stuff. My mama, when I was in my worst of the worst, I was a professional sinner and I was good at it and I loved every minute of it. It was the best thing I could ever done for myself. It's the only thing I knew to do and I was perfect. I made A plus in sinning all the time. My mama, every morning, from the time I turned 14 until the time I left that house, she would get a bottle of oil. Now, I'm Baptist. She would get a bottle of oil, olive oil, put it on her hand. As I would walk out the door, going to the school bus stop, she would grab me by the shoulder, turn around, put the oil on her hand, and go like this. The Lord bless you, keep you, and hold you in his care until the day you return home. Every day she did that, no matter how bad I was, no matter how much I didn't like her doing it, every day my mama did that. I, I brought bombs to school trying to show off to my friends. I brought knives to school. This is before all this stuff was illegal. I did all kinds of crazy stuff when I was a kid. I'm telling you, I was bad. But every day my mama would come. Raffi, come on over here. I remember one time she had slapped me so down with oil on my forehead like that. I'm going to bus stop thinking, they're looking at my forehead. Everybody kept looking at me funny. I'm like, what y'all looking at me funny for? And I'm thinking there's something on my forehead, so I'm going like this the whole time. And I'm going to the bathroom at school. I'm like, is it still there? Because everybody kept looking at me funny. And I never understood why people kept looking at me funny. I'm thinking it's because of the oil. It's because I don't rub my head wrong because I'm trying to get the oil off. <laughs> but you need to be careful what you say. Your words have power to influence someone else's destiny. Because if you keep telling other people how bad they are, how dumb they are, how no good they are, how lazy they are, they're going to eventually believe it. And once you believe it, now Satan has done his job. Now he can go do some more work and more damage into the mind of the person you just destroyed. How many people have committed suicide because they heard about, you know, they, they, they heard their mama and them calling them, oh, I'm, I'm no good, oh, I'm stupid. Well, I'm just a no-good crackhead, drug addict, pimp, prostitute, whatever. And then they go feel like there's no hope. And then they kill themselves. Satan has come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his main job. And the way he likes to do it, words. That's why you have to be careful with what you listen to. That's why you have to be careful with what you watch. Because as a psychologist, we know one thing happens in your body. You never forget anything that comes inside these ears. You may have what we call failure to retrieve, but you never forget. Isn't it amazing how people with Alzheimer's can remember things that happened back when they were teeny tiny? You never forget just a failure to retrieve. So I'm here to let you know, all that junk and hippity hop and honky tonkin that you've been listening to, oh, my exes live in Texas, oh, my pimps and my girls and my chili mamas, all that stuff is inside you. And if you don't do what the word of God says and take those thoughts captive, cast them down, Satan will use those thoughts at a later date to destroy your life and those around you. You think this is a game. This is not a game. I've saw the beheadings. The end result of what Satan wants to do is he wants to take you out. This is not a game. I got an example. Well, let me move on real quick because I'm going to get to this example. And I'm going to need a a couple of volunteers. So if you don't want me to pick on you, you might want to move 
all the way to the back. And half the church has moved to the back. <laughs> Here we go. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Here we go. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. When you get there, say amen. The verse that I was going to start with was verse 16. But I'm going to start at verse 15 because it brings home a point about the power of how Satan will use your words. Because it says in verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, be let, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Bite and devour means nitpicking, complaining. Oh, I don't like the way Pastor dressed this morning. He didn't say hi to me. I'm just up. You just, I just, what the Bible say? But if you bite and devour one another with your words, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Now here it goes, verse 16. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts or wars against the spirit. Let me explain it to you. Your flesh is your body. Now the Bible has already explained something. You are spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit has its life in Christ now. Your flesh still has its earthly desires. Your soul is you, the, the, the ability to make the decision between right and wrong. So I'm going to need a volunteer. Now, Billy, you sick. Uh, I want you to come up here, brother. I'm going to pick on you. And, uh, right, well, hold up. You sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. I need you come because you, you big and bad. Come on up here. Yeah. I, uh, I need one, the, the little Ramos girl, the little one in the middle. Come here. I need, I need, a, small, I need a small person. I need, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I want you to see this. Because I'm going to explain this concept to you. Because many people don't understand how this spiritual warfare thing works. Oh, that's why I'm like, oh, Jesus, he's going to cut me. Before you know Jesus, before you met Jesus, your spirit man was Little bitty, teeny tiny, did not, it's not even alive. It's just waiting for the Lord to come save him. Okay? So this is your spirit. I'm the soul, and this is your flesh. Now look how big your flesh is before you met Christ. Now you're supposed to be making decisions to follow Jesus and do the right thing, right? But look what happens. Come on, grab my arm. Now, let's play tug of war with your, your mind. Be gentle with me. Now which one do you think I'm going to lean towards? Which one? Come on, point to the one. I'm going I'm I'm to go to my flesh, right? Why? Because I've been feeding it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, secular music, X-rated movies. You name it, me and my flesh, we had a jolly good time in the devil. And now that I'm trying to get saved and trying to walk with Jesus, my poor little spirit man, he's, she's telling me, oh, I need to love my neighbor. Oh, I need to not steal and fornicate. Fornicate means sex before marriage. I need, oh, I need to obey my parents. But it's so easy to listen to him because he's the one I've been feeding. Now, you can sit down. Now, big guy. No, 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 no. I want that big, big burly guy right there. You. Come on up, brother. I know your knees are hurting. <laughs> now, here's what happens when you spend time with Jesus and you study his word and you get his word in you and you meditate on his word day and night. Here's what happens. Big old spirit man is full of the word of God. Hallelujah. Yes, I've been studying the word of God. Now when my spirit man says, Raphael, tap me on the shoulder and say, Raphael, it's time to pray. I'm going to listen to that. He still got some influence in my life. So what do I do to tip the balance? Refrain from feeding your flesh. How do you refrain from feeding, feeding your flesh? Real simple. The things you used to do and say, you don't do and say no more. That's simple. When I was a heathen, I was in the club. I danced like the best of them. I tell my, I was getting down. I drank with the best of them. I smoked my little weed from uh, one time. I didn't like it. I was, a, I was a whiskey man. I drank a lot. I was a womanizer. I drank a lot. But when I got born again, I started to starve my flesh. Now, you can sit down. Let me, uh, little man next to uh, Travis Trent, come up here for a second. I'm going to pick on you now. Come on. Come on down. The price is right. 
Now, let me tell you what happens when you starve your flesh, when you don't put those things in you that the devil can use to mess you up. Who do you think is going to win this battle? <laughs> That's how this warfare works. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The devil uses the things around you, the music, the television, the radio, even some of the books you read. I've seen lady reading books. I'm like, good Lord Jesus, what are you doing reading that stuff? And you think you're going to have a blessed life. You think you're going to follow Jesus. Let me tell you something. When you feed your spirit and you start feeding your flesh, you're not going to have a choice but to do what's right. Because it's going to compel you. Trust me. I love you. Amen. He will compel me. Raphael, you're going to cut that grass. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Y'all may be seated. Give me a hand. All right. I hope I made that point clear. All right, let's go to uh, James chapter 1. And let's look at... Uh, Let's look at verse 12. I'm going to explain a concept to you. This is a very important concept. Now, we know that Satan's primary modus operandi is words. We know that he likes to use things around you. Media, music, you know. How many of you guys smoke? I used to smoke, so how many of you guys smoke? Now, who gave you your first cigarette? A friend. What did they say? You know what? Now, you heard what I said, right? What did they say? See how the devil works? Now, how many of you guys were addicted to alcohol at one point or may still be going through addiction? Who told you to take, what did they, t what did they say to you to get you to take that first drink? You look thirsty. Go ahead, take a swig. <laughs> how many of you guys, I'm going to start stepping on toes. How many of you guys out there meddle with witchcraft? Okay, nobody did witchcraft. I'm going to step on the toes now then. How many of you guys out there were guilty at one point or another of being a hellraiser? Raise your hands. <laughs> if you remember the first time you raised hell in your neighborhood, or first time, what happened? Because I remember what happened to me. It was always that little friend saying, Raphael, you going to take that? You better, you better say something. Or mom and dad told you, don't you ever let no one take the upper hand on you. Someone had to tell you to be that way. You just didn't wake up automatically and became a hellraiser. Someone convinced you to do it. That's how Satan operates. But I digress. Let's go back to James <laughs> chapter 1. So, here we go. Blessed, I'm sorry, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Let me explain one thing to you. God can't be tempted by sin. He doesn't like sin. He can't be tempted by your nasty words. I'm telling you right now, don't ever say when you're tempted, you're tempted by God. What does the Bible say? Let's keep on going real quick. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when those desires are conceived, it gives forth birth to sin. And then sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Now, before I let you go, let me let you know right now, if you're watching this broadcast over television, you're living in sin. You're being tricked by the devil. I just want to let you know right now, if you make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, he can set you free of that sin. He can, he can liberate you. He can give you a new mind, a new walk, a new talk. Just follow him. Amen? Y'all have a great day. Now you can shut it off. Okay, now the broadcast is over. Now I'm going to get in your business. A lot of people talk about temptation, and they don't really know what temptation is. Temptation is that little subtle thing that mentioned, that's mentioned in Ephesians called the wiles of the devil. What is temptation? Temptation is just trickery. If he can trick you by tempting you, 
I put a carrot in front of this, this horse, I'm not gonna call you a horse, sorry. <laughs> if I put a, a, a cupcake or a Krispy Kreme donut in front of Pastor Billy, the Krispy Kreme ain't got no power. It's what the Krispy Kreme means to him that has the power. So what Satan will do is, he will trick you with temptation. Oh, you know that Krispy Kreme look good. Oh, brother, look at the size of that. Woo! Oh, honey, child, you see that man back there? His arms are so, woo! He will trick you into doing his dirty deeds. He will trick you. He will tempt you. See, let me explain something to you right now. The only power that Satan has against you as a believer is trickery. He can't do nothing else. If Satan had the ability to take this plate and just whack it across your head, knock your lights out, don't you think he would have done it by now? But what Satan will do is, like I told you, he will use someone else who's not submitted to the Holy Spirit, who's not following Jesus, to do the job for him. That's why it's important that as we grow in our relationship with Christ, you have to get to the point where you feed your spirit and starve your flesh Elsewise, you will always be tricked by the devil to do something stupid to hurt yourself or someone else. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you got a big old whammy coming at you. Because with the Christian, we have a battle. We're warring in the flesh against the spirit, against the flesh, against the spirit. We're in a war, but you, you're just a slave. You're a slave to sin. You have no other option. The Bible, Jesus said with his own words, God does not hear the prayers of sinners. He don't hear them. You can't go to Jesus without believing in him, asking him to help you with this issue because you're going to be powerless. He can't help you because you're not his. So guess what happens? 90% of all murders in the world are done by those who don't even know Jesus. So if you want to see a change in society, wouldn't it behoove us to get folk born again? That's the first step. Then the next step is get them in the word of God. And then the next step is teach these people, refrain from feeding your flesh. Do I, am I making myself clear? So to the sinners out there, to those who don't know Jesus Christ, to those who have not made this Christ your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to make a hardcore decision. Do you want to keep being a slave a prostitute being pimped by the devil, that every wind and sway of his breath, you do what he says do. Because when you're a heathen, there are, there are people that are good heathens. I know a lot of heathens that are good. They, they, don't, they don't believe in Jesus and they're good people. But I tell you what, when their time of temptation comes, they always fall. Because they don't have that force, that power, that Jesus influence, that Holy Spirit influence tugging on them saying, hey, no. But right now, the Holy Spirit might be tugging on your heart. That if you don't know Jesus, and you're tired of waging this battle, and you want to finally win and get victory in your life, how many of you want victory in your life right now? Raise your hand. If you want victory in your life right now, here's how you do it. You come to Jesus. And you say, Jesus, take my life. Take all of it. Not just some of it, but take all my life, Jesus. Because without you, I am powerless you're not going to have victory without Jesus. So with every eyes closed, every head bowed, I want you to think. I want you to self-reflect. As musicians come, I want you to think about your life. I mentioned two classes of people, technically three. I got those who are feeding their spirit and starving their flesh, and they're fighting this battle, and they're winning on a daily basis. I talked about those people who are born again but still are given over to the desires of their flesh because they've been feeding their flesh more than their spirit. And I've also talked about those out there who don't even have a, who aren't even in a battle. They're just slaves being pimped by Satan. If you are in a position where you need to be set free, if you're in a, in a place where you need God to give you victory, over a sin issue. Let me explain something to you. The Bible says, lay down every weight and sin that easily besets us. A weight is not necessarily a sin, people. 
Think about it. We know what sins are. But see, smoking's not a sin. But it's a weight because we know it'll kill you someday. Drinking is not a sin. But one sip too much and you're drunk and you're already in sin. It's a weight that can be used by Satan to destroy your life. See, there are a lot of things out there. Watching rated R movies, people, it's not a sin. But it's a weight. Because Satan will use those weights to get into your mind to destroy those around you and eventually destroy you too. So if you need prayer, if you need someone to intercede and just pray for you, as musicians play, I'm opening up this altar. Come on down here.